Hi, my name is Alicia Yeaman. I'm a human rights lawyer and a public health professional, and I'm a senior scholar in residence at the Global Health Education and Learning Incubator at Harvard University. Today we're going to talk about gender and advancing sexual and reproductive rights. And this is important because on the one hand, the need for gender equality be, to be at the center of development programming is recognized increasingly. It's a goal in the Sustainable Development Goals. But on the other hand, we face an unprecedented backlash against even the very concept of gender and against sexual and reproductive health and rights today. So I'm going to do a few things. First, I'm going to talk about what gender means as opposed to sex. Then I'm going to talk about gender ideology and gender stereotypes, why gender stereotypes are important and how we know we have them, and then how can we dismantle them to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights. So first, what's the difference between sex and gender? Sex is a biological fact it is what Judith Butler referred to as facticity. Women have vaginas. Women have uteruses. Sex is not binary, we know that, but in general, women have vaginas and uteruses, and women face discrimination in their sexual and reproductive rights because of those differences. So, for example, there are many cases where women don't have access to essential and life-saving services, such as emergency obstetric care, because their reproductive health needs are different from those of men. But gender is a different concept. Gender is the social significance that we place on those biological differences. And the social significance is something which can change. It is a product of human choices, of political choices, of social norms, of cultural traditions. So, for example, gender roles and gender norms vary across countries. Women in the 21st century in Western Europe or the United States may play very different roles or follow different scripts than women in much more traditional societies. Gender roles also change over time as laws and policies and understandings of women's abilities in society change and medical and technological advances occur. So women played very different roles a couple of hundred years ago than they do today. Women also are not all the same. So the gender roles that one class or one race of women uh, play is very different from the gender roles that are played by minority women, indigenous women in a country, women who have disabilities, women of different classes, lesbian women as opposed to straight women. So all of those different threads of identity affect the kind of social construction of how we behave with each other. So what are gender ideology and gender stereotypes? Gender ideology, the, the word ideology, is to say that the concept that I just described of gender actually doesn't exist. That women and men have essential roles to play that are natural, that are God-given in many cases. So women, because by virtue of their reproductive capacities, are essentially mothers and also have essentially child care and caregiving roles in society. And anything that deviates from that traditional patriarchal role of the family and of women within the patriarchal family is labeled ideology. So that is to deny that women's roles have different political and social significances across time and across space and spatial context. The promotion of gender ideology is now being very deliberately done, especially in certain countries of Eastern Europe and in Latin America by Catholic and evangelical political actors and churches. What are gender stereotypes, then? 
Stereotypes are shortcuts for understanding the world. But when those stereotypes are used to establish superiority or inferiority, they can be very, very damaging. And that happens a lot with gender stereotypes. So one very common gender stereotype is that all women want to be mothers. So any individual woman who doesn't want to be a mother is condemned as deviant or abnormal. A second very common gender stereotype is that women either don't know when we want to have sex and who we want to have sex with, or that we become manipulative Machiavellian liars afterward and can't be relied upon to give honest declarations or statements. And this gender stereotype is incredibly important because it then plays out in the rights we have when we denounce intimate partner violence or sexual assault or when, when women or girls need to seek abortions because they're pregnant as a result of sexual assault. So before we go on to what we can do to dismantle gender stereotypes, it's also important to know how we know when we have them. Because stereotypes by their very nature are internalized. Internalized images we carry around of the world that are so naturalized that we take them for granted. Most women have experienced some kind of sexual assault during the course of our lifetimes. And if the thought of revealing that, of denouncing that, brings about a sensation of shame or guilt or self-doubt that maybe we didn't dress a certain way or maybe I had too much to drink that night or maybe I was flirtatious or encouraged some kind of action by um, a man, that small sensation and that first reluctance to talk about it, that taboo, is a very common indication that there is some kind of internalized stereotype. So what can we do if we notice that we have internalized such a stereotype? Here I want to point to the work by Rebecca Cook and Simone Cusack on dismantling gender stereotypes for judiciaries. They argue that there should be a three-step methodology in dismantling these stereotypes. First, we have to name it. We have to see what these stereotypes are because they are so naturalized, because we take them for granted. The second thing we need to do is determine how they operate in a specific context. So in a health system, in a legal system, in uh, a specific institution in which we're working. And the final thing we need to do, which they apply specifically to judicial decisions, is to interpret the norms whether they are, I would say, legal norms, judicial norms, or n practical norms in our workplaces and our communities in ways that overcome or eliminate the discriminatory effect on women. The Argentine Supreme Court, in a case in which it extended the exception to abortion criminalization for sexual assault, mm -hmm. so first they say this court perceives that it needs to denounce this. So in other words, it is naming the stereotype. It is outing it. The second thing it does is recognize how the stereotype operates both in the health system. It is not up to health providers if a woman has been sexually assaulted to deny that woman access to a legal right. It is not up to judges or magistrates in the legal system to decide whether the woman has a right or not, she automatically has the right. Finally, the court says, and all of these bureaucratic barriers, the idea that women should have a second opinion before she can obtain an abortion, are not only unnecessary as a matter of law, but actually violate rights. They themselves can be seen as institutional violence. So the court names the stereotype 
that women don't know when they want to have sex or what they want to do with their bodies. It identifies how the stereotype operates in specific contexts, in this case the health and the legal system in Argentina, and it interprets norms in ways that destroy that stereotype, destroy the discrimination that it means for women. That is a specific methodology to apply to judiciaries. But in fact, policymakers, educators, we ourselves can apply similar methods to first question whether we hold these stereotypes and how they are affecting our behavior, whether in lawmaking, a policymaker, or a programmer in a health program, or even in our interactions day to day with women and men.